Is our technology all working beautifully? Good. Um, so, uh, welcome. Um, we're trying a different system this morning, which is Ruth running the joint we on her with all her electronics. Nick is in the centre with um, my mum and I can see Ted and Marion and I can see Norman. So that's the plan um, to try and cut down on the old heating costs in the church. And also it was freezing in the church last week. So that's the plan for that. And then lots of us are at home, which is great. So we're seeking to learn from those who've walked with God in the past uh, so that we can do the same today and for each of the seven days of the coming week. For those of you who've looked at your uh, batting order, you will realize why I'm on about seven days of the coming week. And for those of you who haven't, uh, then you will find out. Okay, on we go. Uh, so when we uh, begin our Bible story, which is gonna be ongoing throughout the morning, um, today and always, we're trying to find out what the person in the story did in terms of their walk with God, Today it's Naaman and Elisha. And perhaps more than that, we're trying to learn what from them we can learn about our walk with God. So all the way through, you're gonna get this funny little person, this funny little white man with a question mark. That's reminding you not to get so bogged down in uh, some ancient story of something that happened um, thousand years ago that you lose sight of what am I learning about my walk with God so that's your little uh, reminder thank you moving on so it's Naaman um, who is an army general with leprosy so on the face of it not a lot to do with us none of us I don't believe are army generals and um, none of us have this particular problem of leprosy. But nevertheless, we're gonna stick in there and think about what we can learn from him. On we go. So I believe I have seen Phoebe. Phoebe is basically going to be reading the whole of the way through the service for us. So Phoebe, you need to unmute yourself. And then if you could read us, this is gonna be picture one children, other than Phoebe, you'll have to do yours later. Uh, this is picture one. And this is the first um, slide of our story. Thank you, Phoebe. Naaman was a commander of the army of the King Aram. He had won many battles and was highly regarded by his king. God had used him to give victory to Aram. However, this brave soldier discovered he had a terrible skin disease called leprosy. Moving on. Off you go, Phoebe, just the white writing. The kingdom of Aram, or Syria, was not far from the kingdom of Israel, where the prophet Elisha lived. Thank you, Phoebe, very much. Carry on. Now bands of rages from Aram, also known as Syria, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she was served Naam's wife. Thank you. I'm sorry to be a pain, Ruth. Do you mind going back to, um, that's it. So that's your first slide, kids. Setting the scene of Naaman with his skin disease, who was the commander of the army of King of Aram. Your second picture, thank you, Ruth. You don't have to draw the map but you need to know that Aram was Syria and it was near Israel. Of course, map drawing is very good. I would never want people to think that map drawing isn't good, but you don't have to be able to draw that complicated map. And then your third picture, sorry, Ruth, um, is that you've got this young girl who's been taken captive from Israel, who's serving Naaman's wife. So you've got um, a slave girl, a servant girl, who's been taken captive. Thank you, Ruth. 
Okay, so uh, children be refining your first three pictures. Uh, I hope the rest of us have picked up. Naaman is not a believer. He's not part of Israel. He's a foreign army commander. And he's someone who has captured Israelites. So in one sense, you might think he's a bit not somebody that God would be particularly interested in. Um, he's a bit out. He's a, a foreign army commander who's captured Israelites. Moving on. But he is a brave commander and leprosy is devastating, um, both physically and socially in those days, devastating. So God's scope is big because this story is all going to be about this army commander and he's across space. He's not just interested in the in crowd. He's able to use, it says that um, God had used him. So God's scope is big. And it's across time because Jesus, 800 years later, picks up on this um, Naaman and Elisha story. It, he says in Luke, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So God's scope is big and wide. Let's move on. So this is your fourth picture, I believe, um, gang. We won't move on at quite this speed later on in the story, but this is your fourth picture. So Phoebe, if you can read us what happens next. She said to her mistress, if only Nahum would see the prophet who is in Sam Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Nahum asked the king of Aram to write a letter to the king of Israel and set off to visit him with gifts of silver, gold and expensive clothing. OK, so we've got this little girl. And she speaks to her mistress, Naaman's wife, and says, there is someone who could do something about this leprosy problem, potentially. Um, why doesn't Naaman go and see him? Now, notice that actually Naaman asks the king of Aram to, to write a letter to the king of Israel. This doesn't actually involve Elisha, the prophet, at this stage. Um, Naaman goes to his king and asks his king to write a letter to the king of Israel. And then he sets off with all these gifts um, of gold and stuff like that. So notice it's a servant and a girl who is used by God. And that servant or a girl, moving on, wants to help her master, who isn't actually an Israelite. He's a Syrian. So we've got a potentially bad situation here. We've got um, an Israelite girl who's been taken into captive, who's serving her master, Naaman and his wife. And she sticks her neck out. She knows God. She's faithful to God, even following capture. So she's not primarily, it seems to me, feeling sorry for herself and angry and frustrated that she's a servant and that she's been captured. It seems as if actually she's making the best of a bad situation. Um, we don't know how well looked after she was. I guess she must have been relatively well looked after. She's making the best of a bad situation and she's still seeking to be faithful to God. Because if you she wouldn't, if she wasn't, she wouldn't suggest that Naaman went to Israel. So she's still looking out, even in a bad situation, for ways of being effective. And I think she took a bit of a risk here. 
she's suggesting that there's no one in Syria who can sort Naaman out. He needs to go to Israel where there's a prophet. Um, you sort of think it might not have gone so well for her. You don't quite know what Naaman and his wife's reaction would have been. Now, perhaps she knows her master and mistress well enough to know that that was safe. I rather think um, people in power can be unpredictable. And she did, it seems to me, stick her neck out a bit, wanting to do good, wanting to see Naaman healed or something good happen to Naaman. And she's on the lookout for ways of pointing people to God, even in a difficult situation. And let's find out what happens next. So Phoebe, off you go. The king of Israel read the letter. I am sending my servant Nahum to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. The king tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring people back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? He must be trying to pick a quarrel with me. Okay, so thank you, Phoebe. That's picture five. The king of Israel freaking because... Um, He's received this uh, letter and he knows his limitations. Let's move on. He knows there's nothing he can do about a man with leprosy. Certainly in those days, he couldn't even offer medical advice or guidance. Um, so he knows his limitations. So in one sense, I think I'm with him. Um, however, we are talking about the king of Israel, God's particular country although we have seen quite clearly that actually God is a big God but you might have expected him to know better how do the people of God react to difficult bad situations we might expect them to know better and he did know he had a prophet in his land. He did know that there was somebody he should have been able to turn to, even if he felt inadequate himself. Thank you, Ruth. I think the problem was he was more focused on his own safety. I can't do this. What are people going to think of me? I'm the king. I should be able to do everything. I can't. Perhaps he was more focused on his own status. This doesn't make me look cool. This doesn't make me look like I'm the king because actually there's nothing I can do about this problem. And maybe he was fearful that the king of Syria was looking for a way to, you know, say, well, this king of Israel doesn't know what he's doing. Let's go and invade or whatever. So he, because his, his reactions were all about himself um, and he was more focused on that, he, he just freaks and shouts and says, you know, what can I do? I'm not God. He wasn't grounded in God, it would appear. Because when it came to a quick decision in a crisis, he didn't turn to God. And actually, it was too late then to put that in place. That needed to have been put in place before somebody like Naaman arrived so that when Naaman arrived his reactions were more godly and were more less focused on his own status and his own well-being I feel like by then it was too late in one sense so just uh, you know the, the green question mark what do I hear about how my walk with God when the crisis comes when you're faced with something that you can do nothing about that you're pat, you feel powerless in, what's your reaction? Rant and rave, we are human, a bit of that may be, but you know, we are the people of God. Let's find out what happens next. Phoebe, thank you. When Elisha, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, why have you torn your robes? Send the man to me and he will know that there is a prophet 
prophet in Israel. Thank you, Phoebe. So picture six, this is Elisha. This is the first time we've seen Elisha. Thank you. And um, he's telling his servants to send a message. Uh, can I encourage us? Elisha is proactive. He's looking for ways to serve God. It isn't that the message comes to him. He sends the message. He hears about it and he wants to do something about it. He's proactively looking for ways to bring about the kingdom of God. So he's not opting for the quiet life. He didn't have to do this, folks. He was getting on with whatever he was getting on with. And this message had come to him. It was somebody had obviously talked about it. You know, news had got round. But there's no, there's no implication here that he had to do anything. He's certainly not asked by the king. So he's seeking to find ways to do good and extend the kingdom. The temptation in COVID, I think, is to hide away. Um, and some of that is very responsible, very responsible, that we in, in so doing, we are extending the kingdom of God. We are extending healing by not causing others um, to be put into danger. Um, but we have just heard prayer led by someone who went to work knowing the danger and the danger came about. Lorraine did pick up the virus. Now, I'm not saying that all of us are called to do that, but I do think the temptation is to hide away. We need to continue to find ways to serve God without being irresponsible, but we do need not to opt just for the quiet life. Now, opting for the quiet life at the moment is in itself a sacrifice. There's no doubt about that, but finding that balance are there bits of good we can still do are there ways of extending the kingdom we can still do them so Elisha's heard this message um, about um, Naaman going to the king and this is what happens next Phoebe so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the, in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Thank you. Carrying on, next picture. Okay, Phoebe. Nahum was furious and said, I thought that he would come out, stand, come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and cure me of my leprosy. The river of Damascus are better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I wash them, wash in them and be cleansed? He turned and went off in a rage. Why did Elisha not go out why did he send a message and why was this message so unwelcome why did it was it this way that Elisha chose to act he clearly wasn't motivated by popularity that's clear um, whatever whatever reason there was for Elisha saying to sending a messenger not even going out himself sending a messenger that says Go and wash in the River Jordan seven times and you will be healed. He's clearly not wanting to be the centre of attention. That's one thing. He hasn't, we, as far as we know in this story, he doesn't leave his house. He just sends a messenger out. Um, moving on. And Naaman is furious at this point. 
Naaman isn't really at this point even prepared to listen to an unwelcome message. Um, there's your green question mark with you sitting there thinking, does this ring any bells? That if a message is not welcome, it's not done the way we want, or it's not what we were expecting to hear, it's not the way we think God should be working, we, we can't cope with it at times. So at, at this point, Naaman is, is furious. I don't think we know why Elisha did it this way. I think we have to assume that the understanding that God had given Elisha of Naaman was that his big issue was going to be pride. It was going to be, I'm a big, important army officer. And actually, if you want to be healed by God, you've got to understand that God is bigger than you and God is all powerful and God will do what God needs to do. And God does not heal because we tell him to. We may be asked to pray in that way and we continue to pray in that way for Mary. But we, God does not heal because we tell him to. And God does not do anything because we instruct him. We are honest before God of what we think we need, but we have to get who is in charge in this process the right way round. And God is the one who is in charge of the process. And I wonder whether the reason why Elisha asks Naaman to do this very odd thing of going and washing himself in some river and not even coming out and speaking to him directly is that he knew that Naaman had got to work out who was in charge in this process. Um, I've got some sympathy for Naaman. He was an army commander. He was used to being in charge. He was used to being the, the one who made the decisions. And maybe it was going to be a very hard thing to learn that actually on this one, he was powerless. And maybe even when we're asking God to do something, there is a way of asking God that is saying that I'm the one in control here. You will heal when I ask and when I tell you and in the way in which I ask ask and I tell you and maybe there's a subtlety here of Naaman having to learn about what it means to submit yourself to God. I wonder whether he was struggling with ultimately control passing to God. Yes he wanted to be healed I'm sure of that but did he really want the the full impacts of submitting himself to God? I wonder. So let's move on. So this is going to be picture nine, children, and any adults who are doing this to stop themselves um, falling asleep or um, getting itchy feet and fingers. Uh, let's read on what happens. Phoebe. Naaman's servant went to him and said, if the prophet had told you to do something, to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then? When he tells you, wash and, wash and be cleansed. So Naaman set off to the River Jordan. Set okay. off to the River Jordan. Well done. So this is his servants moving on coming to him so it's the second time God uses the weak and his servants convince him it's his servants that stick their neck out and take a risk because again they're the servants they're speaking to the army commander again they're taking the risk how is this man of power going to react when a 
less powerful person says, come on, this you can do this, this is sensible, this is what you've been told to do. Um, now, some of us will identify more with Naaman. We're used to being in charge. We're used to being the powerful. Some of us I will identify more with the servants. We're used to feeling powerless. What can I do? I'm no, not important. There's nothing I can do. Either way, yeah, uh, we need to remember Mary from uh, the Christmas story as she discovers that uh, what you might think of as a powerless person um, is going to be used by God to give birth to the Son of God. So this is what happens, Phoebe. He went down into the river and dipped once, then twice. Okay, moving on. So Naaman has got to the point where he has submitted to God. He's gone down into the river in a foreign country and so far twice he's dipped himself. He's got to do this seven times. Children, I want you to use the back of your board and I want you to think of something that you struggle with, something that you, you know happens that shouldn't happen quite a lot. Adults, you're doing the same process. So do you know that you tend to get bad tempered just before tea time? Or do you know that when you've not slept well, you're grumpy? Or do you know that there's somebody at work that you repeatedly run into problems with? Um, and I want you to, children, as we, as the adults are going through this, I want you to try and draw it somehow. And then I want you to wipe it away. And then I want you to try and redraw it and wipe it away. And I want you to try and redraw it and wipe it away. And you're going to do that seven times, because that's how many times Naaman had to do this process of going into the river and coming out and then going in and coming out. You get started on that. Um, adults, we do suffer from repeated sin, but we have the great benefit of repeated forgiveness, of God constantly wiping the slate clean. And I want us to have acknowledge both of those. There is repeated sin and there is repeated forgiveness. So while you might think to yourself, oh, for goodness sake, why do I keep doing the same thing? There's no, this is hopeless. There's also repeated wiping of the whiteboard clean. The idea is, and children that are very clever might do this, uh, the sin should get smaller and less frequent and it may go away completely. It may be something that we will deal with completely and then God will move on to something else. If you look back at the old slide, don't worry, Ruth, you're working so hard. But Naaman's face he is struggling with how God is answering his need. This is not a happy man in this river doing this at this stage. This is hard going for Naaman. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that picture says I'm doing it. I'm here. I'm hanging in there, but I'm not happy about this. OK, so thank you so much, Ruth. Um, he's struggling in terms of allowing God to have the final say in how we live. And it's always going to be something we half want and we half don't want. The idea is that we want to try and change the fractions. Yeah. So maybe we half want God in charge and we half don't want God in charge. Well, the idea is that the God in charge fraction gets bigger, goes up to three quarters as life goes on. And the bit that doesn't want God goes down to perhaps a quarter. And then if we learn to be very wise and we keep working on these things with God, it gets up to 90 percent and 10 percent, nine tenths and one tenth. Um, the idea is, though, that there is repeated sin. We acknowledge that. But there is repeated forgiveness. And there is this 
ongoing dialogue with God. He dipped a third and a fourth time. Next slide. Off you go, Phoebe. He dipped a fifth and a sixth time. Thank you. OK, let's go on. So I would commend to you here the benefit of repeated habits, good habits. Yeah. OK, this is Naaman submitting himself to God repeatedly. Next. Uh, there is in our walk with God the need for ongoing dying and rising. It is not just a case of a one off, you know, um, I, I, I give myself to you, dear God, and I rise in glory and that's the end of it. Woo! -hoo! Well, in one sense, that's true. But in another sense, there is this need for ongoing dying to ourselves and the way we want to do things and rising to doing things God's way. On we go. Uh, so there is this need, I think, as maturing Christians for a balance between a real recognition of sin, of the fact that we mess up and we struggle, and also this message from God that there is repentance, the slate is wiped clean, the whiteboard does not stay with the black on it, and there is victory. And it's both and, folks, it's not either or. On we go. And every day of the week, these repeated habits, this ongoing dying and rising, this ongoing need for repentance and for joy that actually it is sorted every day of the week on we go for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god and for me in there i know there's masses you could talk about in there but it's our being saved yes we are saved but we are also in the ongoing daily process of being saved. However, there is a place for uh, a one-off um, saying to God, I want to be yours and I want to rise up as a follower for you. Nahum and all his attendants went back to Elisha Nahum told him, now I know that there is no God, that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant, Elisha replied. As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Even though Nahum urged him, he refused. Nahum promised Elisha he would only worship the Lord God in future. Nahum asked Elisha if he could be forgiven when he had to bow in the temple of Rimmon because he was helping the king of Aaron and I can't see it. Elisha said go in peace. Well done, Phoebe. Thank you very much indeed for doing all that. So uh, let's move on. Naaman knew that when he went back, there would have to be working out. There would have to be compromise. He asks about this business that he's going to have to worship um, or bow down, at least, in front of another god. And we know there are stories in the Bible where um, followers of God refuse to do that and know that that isn't for them right so we have to work it out and it would appear that Naaman got this correct because Elisha says go in peace so our church activities are here this week uh, they're on that screen and we have to work out what we do we have to work out what we don't do we have to work out what we do in our other responsibilities and uh, there may be compromise. What we have to do 
is to go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we have to work out what that looks like for us. Listening to others and listening to people that we might find it difficult to listen to at times. Okay, so we are going to go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, in the name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.